So we're talking this morning to former Swatter man Terry McFlynn, who's now in the the other side of the world. Terry, you've got a wee bit better weather than we have down under. Yeah, it's um, we're we're coming into to winter now at the minute, Michael. But um, yeah, we, the weather at the minute was I think we had 22, 23 degrees uh, today. Um, which is I say, coming into winter, we'll probably drop down to maybe. 17, 18 through winter, but um, which is nice. And then, yeah, obviously, in summer, we can get up anywhere over 40 degrees, which is a little bit too hot for me, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to be down here. And what about the whole lockdown thing? How has it affected you there um, from your own point of view? Um, we we're pretty, I'm over here in Western Australia at the minute. Um, I've been here a year now. Having spent uh, 14 years over in the East Coast in Sydney. Um, so the Premier here in Western Australia was very proactive with the whole um, lockdown from right from the very start. He closed the borders straight away and tried to contain the spread of the virus um, within the state. Um, he also introduced regional um, restrictions so we could only leave, we could only travel probably 25 kilometers from our house um, at any time. So he really isolated the spread of the virus. Um, so we were the first state in, uh, in all of Australia to sort of flatten the curve, as they, as they say, and bring it sort of under control. So um, we were very fortunate. Um, and obviously the school shut down. We were homeschooling the, the kids. Um, from a football point of view, we got stood down as well when the, when the league stopped. So um, yeah, plenty of, plenty of time at home with the family. And um, we're pretty fortunate that uh, we've got a beautiful beach just over the back from um, from where I'm living here at the minute. So we're spending probably two to three hours a day down there. So um, it was at the start, it was more like a holiday than than a crisis. But um, yeah, we made the most of it. You're making the rest of us jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so the home homeschooling. Did I notice on social media, Terry? You're back at school doing a bit of education. Um, any plans to become a teacher after all of this? <laughs> not at all um i've definitely got a, a, a whole new respect for for teachers um after the homeschooling situation but like i said the, the school was excellent as well um they shifted all the kids lessons and everything straight on to online we had a google classroom we'd see saw on various different apps that the kids were logging into every day and, and doing the work and uploading it um sending it through to the teachers and there was there was constant uh, dialogue and feedback from the from the school and from all the teachers. So, um, yeah, definitely no plans for myself to become a move into the education space. But um, like I said, I have a whole new respect for for teachers. Um, my first memory of you, I remember you playing on the Corn and Oak team in Mahara. Um, you beat Anna Skillen in the final at Celtic Park. Mm -hmm. um, would you have went to your soccer shortly after that, or when did you actually leave? Yeah, I think it was it was shortly after that, Michael. Um, if not even during that period, um, my first year at St. Pat's, we actually won the Dalton. Um, we beat, I think it was St. Coleman's. We beat in the final of that one, um, and then yeah, the Corner Nug was the second year. Um, and yeah, I think it was probably around that time that I started playing soccer. Um, started off with Glenview United, a little team that played. Again, in Mahara, um, they played in behind the barracks. Um, at that time, it was before, obviously, the new leisure centre, and that's, that's there at the minute. It was the old pitch that was in there. So, um, yeah, it was probably around that time, the corner nog. Um, and then obviously played down a skill in the final, but in the group game that year, I noticed uh, from looking at the school magazine, you didn't play in it, and you were beaten. So was that around the time you were starting to go to trials and things with soccer, or Terry, at that stage? Yeah, I think it could have been, to be honest, Michael. Um, I know, obviously, because uh, uh, obviously corner and oak training and everything was done after school, um, and that was probably the time where myself and my uncle Mark was uh, travelling to Belfast probably three, four nights a week uh, for the Northern Ireland School Boys trials. Um, so it was probably around that period of time. And then I think I had a, um, an agreement with uh, Mr Hughes that I would... Uh, play the end of the season for the corner nug um, and then yeah thankfully you know, we won it that year and that was sort of the end of my, my Gaelic days at St. Pat's yeah. 
I think you had Fergal Doherty, Paddy Bradley was on that team, Middle Downey twins from Slot Nail, so um, and then you would have moved on after that. Have you m- much yeah. recollection of your school football? What sort of memories come back for you? Um, I think the first year, Michael, to be honest, when we played in the Dalton that year, we won it with Paul Murphy. He was he was probably one of the best Gaelic players that I've played with. Um, he was a lot bigger than everyone at that age, and he played full forward. Um, and we basically just got tried as much as we could to get the ball into him, and then he just did the rest from there. But we had Paul McCluskey, um, Duty, the boxer. Um, he played. Um, I'm trying to think who else was in that team. Togger. Um, yeah. Togger Kelly played. Um, oh God. Yeah. We, we, that, that was a really good team. And then, like you said, the, the following year, or the next group of the boys that came through, Fergal Doherty, um, the McAldoney twins, uh, Paddy Bradley, who's obviously went on to do brilliantly well with Derry. And, um, yeah, we're always very strong, to be honest, mate. We were very strong. Um, and then... The coaching was good as well, you know, Mr. Hughes, Mr. McGuckin, uh, Mr. McNichol at the time. Um, I think that was before Sean, Sean Marty was actually still at the school, so he hadn't moved into coaching at that time. Um, yeah, he was upper sixth that year. He was the McCrory captain in that season. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, um, yeah, we had a group, group, group of boys, good bunch of lads. Um, and, yeah, you know, as I say, when when it went in the, the corner dog was, you know, you, Made all them late nights after school and all them laps around the pitches and, and different things that the <laughs> coaches made you do. Made it all worthwhile in the end. And the Glenview team doesn't exist anymore. I wasn't even aware of it. Was it before Mahara Colts? Was that what Mahara Colts came from at the time, Terry? Uh, Mahara Colts was um, it's probably one of the oldest boys clubs, uh, junior teams in the, in the area at the time. Uh, Glenview United was... Um, man, it was a group of boys from St. Pat's, really. So it was Anton Morin, Niall McGillian, um, uh, Ryan Bradley. Um, so Snowy was with us at Glenview for a year. Then he went to Mahara Colts, and then most of us followed him uh, across the Mahara Colts. Um, Caleb McKee played. Um, so yeah, so we, only, we only really played one season as a group of boys and then most of us went to Mahara Colts because we were playing in the South Darien District Junior League then um, on the 14s and then at the end of that season um, there was I think it was myself Darren McMath and Niall McGurlain got picked for the South Derry um, and District uh, team to play in the Mill Cup and the most of that group was all from Mahara Colts so when we played in the Mill Cup um at the end of the Mill Cup, then we just signed for Mahara Colts, and that was basically our team then the following season. It was the Mill Cup your sort of avenue then to to the shop window for the for the whole soccer scene then. Is yeah, that when you, well, you get picked up. The first the first Mill Cup, like I say, was the South Darien District um, team we played for. After that, I got a couple of um, interest from Wolves and Walsall in England um, and then that was around the time when the school Northern Ireland schoolboy trials um, had started so I went uh, to the, the trials um, and then from there there was a scout called Eddie Coulter was a Manchester United scout um, so from there I went across to Man United on trial um, and then sort of that progressed through till I made the squad um, and then we played in the Adidas Victory Shield, which is uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and England. Um, and then we had a game against the Republic of Ireland down in, in Dublin. Um, uh, we finished nil-nil in the game. And then after that, I was invited across to QPR. And then on the back of, I was over there for a week. And then they offered me a five-year contract um, after that. That's a good contract to get at that age. You know, yeah. Five years. Yeah, I think at that time, you know, we had, in the schoolboy squad, we had uh, boys that had signed at um, Wolves, Reading. Um, there's myself and another guy, Richard Graham, was at QPR. Kieran Toner was at Crystal Palace. 
Um, oh, sorry, Kieran Turner was at Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, Kieran Lockham was at Crystal Palace. Uh, Ricky Culbertson was at Rangers. Um, Gareth Macklin was at Man United. Um, George McCartney was at Sunderland. So we had a lot of boys that was at uh, English clubs at the time, and it was sort of it was a good good time to be in and around that group where there was a lot of scouts watching the games and a lot of uh, opportunities for likes of myself and other players that at that time didn't have an English club. Um, so it sort of gave us the opportunity to um, be exposed to the scouts and the academy managers and things like that that presented the opportunities for us. And then growing up, Terry, who did you support or who was your sort of favourite players when you were when you were starting to follow the soccer? Um, well, I sort of supported Man United um, for a little bit. Obviously, followed Celtic um, as well. Roy Keane was probably my hero as a kid growing up. Um, I think just the way he played the game and he had that sort of never say die attitude and I think that shone through in his performances and, and obviously went on to, to do what he did in the game was uh, unbelievable so um, yeah that, that was sort of that era where Man United early 90s through um, all through the 90s where they were very dominant and Roy Keane was very much at the heart of that uh, dominant domination if that's the right word of uh, the Premier League for Man United and your trial with Man United then do you remember much about that? Yeah, we went across on a Friday, myself and uh, Gareth Macklin. Um, um, we were over there for a week. Um, and there was a lot of, obviously all the players that were not from Manchester, so the boys from Newcastle, London, um, Ipswich, uh, Birmingham, um, basically Wales, um, guy Wayne Evans from Wales. John O'Shea was there from Ireland. Um, so it was a really good week, to be honest with you. We, we trained uh, twice a day um, at Littleton Road, which is down the, just down the road from the cliff. Um, this would have been back in 96, 95, 96. So it was before, obviously, Carrington, the new training ground was built. Um, and we played... Oh God, I'm trying to think who we played now. Um, I think it was either Oldham... I think it was I think it was Oldham or Stockport we played on the Saturday. Um and yeah, it was good. It was a really enjoyable time, mate. Um we got to watch the training, um the first team training. So that was when you know they had Ryan Giggs and Lee Sharp, Paul Ince, Roy Keane, uh Dennis Irwin, Eric Cantona, Mark Hughes. Uh, it was sort of that era. So um yeah, that that really give me the extra motivation or the extra drive that I wanted to make a career out of football. Um, just seeing how hard these guys worked every day in training and what it actually took to, to try and get to that level. Um, and that's what I was, I was prepared to do. I think around that time, Ampy Tuchel was over on trial with United. Roughly yeah. around that time, was he? Yeah, so Anthony was playing, I think he was playing for Derry City at the time. And I think I went in the Easter... Um, school holidays and I think Anthony was over shortly after that um, he went over I think he played two or three games for, for the reserve team as well Yeah and I, th I think the sort of consensus at the time was that he had sort of went to soccer too late you know but Yeah I can yeah. And then yourself I think I read on a newspaper article somewhere where it was your uncle Mark sort of was the big push for soccer and they had been coaching you around home and is that where the sort of guidance came from? Yeah, very much so, Michael. So Mark, all through my career, um, was a massive influence on, on every decision that I ever made career-wise, uh, moving teams, moving countries. Um, Mark was always there to support and aid me with anything um, that I needed. They say back when we were just sort of starting out, we go to the park down at Swatra every night um, from probably five o'clock till 10 o'clock at night. Um, and then through the winter months when obviously there's no floodlights in the park, we'll be over next to the wall um, using the street lights just for a bit of a light so we can still play. And, um, so yeah, that was a real foundation really for 
um, which put me in good stead. Like whenever we went to the Northern Ireland trials, just my fitness levels was was very high at that time. Um, and then they, all the skill work and ball work that we did, um, let's like say every night. Um, and Mark, like I said, he was there to take me to Belfast three, four nights a week, um, all through the trials and all through the trainings. And um, so yeah, he's, he's been the biggest influence on my career for sure. And a tough thing leaving home, leaving your family to go across the water. It's obviously an opportunity, and you know QPR give you a five-year contract, but it's still a complete change in lifestyle in every way. Yeah, it was a big, it was a big move, Michael. Obviously, you know what the size of Swatter is, and I think it was even smaller back then. Um, and to go from there at sixteen um, straight to London, into West London, was. A bit daunting, um, to say the least. Um, my mum and dad came over with me um, when I signed. I signed on the pitch. Uh, QPR was in the Premier League at the time. Um, when I signed, then we got we got relegated just before I went in full time um, into the Championship. So yeah, to move across into London, the club was brilliant. To be honest, they they put us in digs with uh, what they call the host family. Um, and basically, what the what the club did was, if it was a player like myself coming from Ireland, um, they had an Irish host family, um, so it was the same sort of culture, same sort of upbringing. So I moved into Diggs um, with another guy from Scaries, um, down just outside Dublin. He was a goalkeeper. Uh, so me and Barry lived with Pauline. Uh, Pauline was originally from Kerry, um, and we lived there for three three years together we were there um, and the club, like I said the club was brilliant so they obviously was paying for the, the digs and um, it was actually it was a couple of times Pauline actually had to come into the to the training ground where the fitness coaches and nutritionists um, called her in and said that she was feeding us too much that we were getting fat so <laughs> um, I think the um, the fry ups in the mornings and um baked potatoes and beans and things at night was a little bit too much for the, them back then. But you now, like I say, it was great um, to move in and just having that home away from home, um, if you can call it that, if it's like that, was was brilliant. And yeah, the club, like I said, they, every every six weeks, um, we got a weekend home. So we'd play on the, the Saturday morning, the academy director was drive us straight out to Heathrow. Um, we'd fly back, we'd have three or four days back home um, and then it was back across for another six weeks. Uh, um, and then at the end of the season, we had, we had five, six weeks off, um, which we obviously came home for as well. So um, no, I can't speak highly enough of, of the club for helping all of us young boys at that time settle into um, not only London, but also professional football. Did I read somewhere that uh, Vinnie Jones was one of your early coaches or he was involved with QPR at the time? Um, Vinnie came a little bit later on. Um, so when I signed at the club, it was... Uh, 97? Stuart. Yeah, Vinnie came probably a bit later. Oh, so I signed in 97, yeah. Vinnie came with Ian Dye and Ray Harford. Ray Harford was the manager. Um, Vinnie was the reserve team manager so Vinny was my boss at the time um, a real he boss was, <laughs> he was a character he was a character he was um, it was actually at the time this will let you tell you when it actually was it was the time that he was filming Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels yeah um, so we he got uh, limousines and took us all to the premiere of uh, the movie up at Leicester Square um, but yeah look it was uh, that was good times like I said, we went through quite a bit at the club. And for me, there was a lot of life lessons that, that stood me in good stead. You know, we went through administration. We went through relegation, um, all sorts of things. There was, they say, Stuart Houston was a manager when I first signed. Then Ray Harford came in. Um, John Hollands was the reserve team manager. Then he moved on. Ian Dye came in. Vinnie Jones, Jerry Francis, um, and then... Uh, Ian Holloway was actually the manager when I left. So um, just working under lots of different managers, different coaches, how they did things, sort of helped me for, for later on in, in my career down the track. 
And after those four years or whatever at QPR, was was the professional soccer set up all what you expected it to be in terms of preparation, you know, level of professionalism? You know, was was it sort of what you expected? Um, the professionalism was what I expected. To be honest, Michael, it was um, you know very much it was a high pressure environment every day. Um, you know, you knew that at any any given time we would have had two, three trialists um, training with us all the time. So you knew that if you weren't performing, your basically your job was up um, to be taken at any point, um, regardless of whether you had a contract or not. And, and in them days, it was easy for the clubs to, to basically turn around and say, right, look, we're going to we're going to move you on. Um, here's a settlement. Um, off you go, find another club. So the the pressure. Day in, day out was, you could feel it, even as a kid. And, you know, when I signed at the club, that was back, um, say, 97, when you still had the apprentice schemes. So we still had to clean boots and um, we had to go to Loftus Road on a Sunday um, and sweep the, the grandstand and all the terraces um, after the games. So it very much instilled a, a work ethic and a, a discipline in the younger players as well. Um but yeah, look, the the professionalism side of it was exactly what you what you see. Um, obviously, it's moved on a lot um, today to what it was back then. But there's a lot more sports science and a lot more emphasis on that now, which um, I got exposed to a lot towards the end of my career. Um, but yeah, look, the, as a profession itself, um, it's a, it is a, a ruthless business. Um, you know, I've seen that um, nearly every club I, I played for. Um, it is a business at the end of the day and managers, coaches, they'll get judged on results and the players are the, the players that the people, sorry, that will produce the results and managers will do what they need to do to get the right people in, in the right position to, to get the results. And then you're involved in a few clubs before you went to Australia then. You were um, walking Markham, you know, two or yep. three clubs before you left. Yeah, so what, ha what happened... Michael, was it was at the time, um, obviously, the Premier League had broken away from the Football League. They had just signed a massive broadcast deal with uh, Sky, would be Sky B at the time. Um, there was another digital platform called ITV Digital, um, which basically bought the rights for the Football League. So everything from the Championship down to what is now League Two. Um, that money was, that money never came through. So before the ITV Digital actually got off the ground. The company itself went, went bust. Um, sorry, my dog's gone mad here. They, um, so the company went bust. So what had happened was a lot of the clubs um, at that time had uh, basically budgeted on that money coming through. Um, the money never came through. So there was a lot of players and a lot of clubs got into financial difficulties and a lot of players got released on the back of that. So... We played Wolves on the Sunday um, when I was at QPR. Um, I had a meeting with the manager during the week um, where I was basically offered a, another one-year contract. Um, I knew the situation the club was in financially. I was still young at the time, early 20s. Um, a lot of higher-earning players had moved on because of the financial situation. Um, and uh, I seen it then as my opportunity um, to become a first team player. Um, but unfortunately, everyone who was out of contract, because we were in administration, the administrators wouldn't let the club sign any players at that particular time. Um, so, like I said, we played the last game on the Sunday away to Wolves. We drew one each. Um, on the Wednesday, I went into the manager's office. Um, and it was basically at a meeting with the administrators. And they told me that my time at the club had come to an end and it was time to move on. So, from there, again, there was a lot of football league clubs that wasn't signing players. Um, so I went to Leighton Orient. Um, I went to Swindon. And then I got a call out of the blue from a, a guy called Colin Lippiot, who was the manager at Woking. And they were playing in the conference at the time. Um, he invited me down for a, a game. Um, and at that time, I was just trying to keep as fit as I could for when an opportunity came around. So I went to play the game. Basically, after the game, he said, look, I want to sign you. Um, we've got big plans to get in the, in the Football League. Um, he asked me what I was earning at, at QPR, and I told him. 
And he said, look, we can definitely pay you that, no problem. Um, they were backed by a very wealthy man at the time. Uh, but he wanted an answer straight away. So it was either whether I was going to hold out for a, a league club or it was a job. You know, and I was mm-hmm. in a position now where um, I was out of work for the first time and I needed to, to get a job. So, um, yeah, I signed at Woking. Uh, Colin was... Um, Basically, at that time, I think we had signed about 35 players. Um, like I said, they were making a real push to try and get into the Football League. Um, so I found myself out of the team, not playing. Um, and I was only a young boy. I needed to be playing football. Um, and a, f- a good friend of mine who had played in the Northern Ireland teams with a guy called Gareth Graham, um, who was at Crystal Palace and then Brentford. Um, he was in a similar situation to myself. The clubs like TV Digital, he he lost his job as well. So he was playing for a club called Margate, um, and he called me and said, "Look, we need a, we're looking for another midfielder. Do you fancy it?" So I was in the coming up to the end of the transfer window. Um, at that time, Margate, uh, well, not at that time, but Margate is down right the bottom of England, down south, and I was still living in London. And I said, oh, look, it's a bit a bit far to travel. Um, and I wasn't going to move down there because, again, it was uh, part-time. It was in the conference. And he, so he basically said, look, all the players, we live in London. Everyone lives in London. We train in London. We only go to Margate for the games. So that suited me perfect. So I signed at Margate. And I was there for, I think, just over two years. And that was probably two of the most enjoyable years of my football, just the, the camaraderie with the boys and the... The group that we had, um, we had a lot of success. We just missed out in the playoffs um, in the second season there. Um, the manager, a guy called Chris Kinnear, um, was a great guy. He got the boys really working together for each other. And um, like I said, we had, we had a lot of a lot of fun um, playing there. And then I was fortunate, Michael, at the time, I was still getting picked to play for Northern Ireland for the under-21s. Um, and a guy called Jim Harvey was the assistant manager of, of Northern Ireland. Um, Sammy McElroy was the manager and Jimmy was his assistant. But Jimmy also was the manager at Morecambe. Um, so every time we'd meet up in uh, training camps or wherever games we were, um, he'd always just get in my ear and say, look, you've got to come and play for me at Morecambe. And, um, Morecambe was owned by a guy called Peter McGuigan, um, who owned Umbro. Um, so he had a lot of money. Um, actually, when he left uh, the club, he sold Umbro to Nike for, I think it was about £280 million or something. Um, and he basically built the club a new stadium um, and set them up financially. So Morecambe was full-time. Um, they were making a real push to get in, into the league, which they did um, a couple of years, uh, about six, seven years back. They got into League Two. They're still in League Two now. So I went, signed for Jimmy. At Morecambe, um, and I was there, uh, I think, in over two years until the, the move to Australia came about. And during that time, you know, you mentioned earlier about the fact that you always discuss everything with Mark. Would you have had an agent during all those dealings, or you know, were you sort of just linking with your family, or because there's a lot of thinking to do and it's difficult? Yeah, look, at that time, I did have an agent. Uh, Michael, um, the chief executive of uh, QPR, when I signed at the club, was a guy called Clive Berlin. Um, Clive left uh, QPR and became an agent. Um, so I signed with Clive probably in 98. Um, and he was my agent all the way through when I was in England until I come to Australia. And obviously, coming down here, he didn't have the the contacts of the connections down here. So um, we're still good, really good friends, but yeah, Clive was my agent um, during my whole time in, in England. Um, so mo- all the decisions was, was made by me and Mark. Clive would present opportunities um, here and there. There's a couple of opportunities to go abroad, um, but I really wanted to stay in England at, at that time um, before the Australian thing came up. And that was obviously... Emma, who's my wife, um, is Australian. That was part of the, the reason as well. But yeah, look, all the all the decisions was was made by me and Mark. Um, but Clive was was very much there, presenting the opportunities and and 
making phone calls and trying to get open doors for us where we could. So did you move to Australia just when the A-League was starting? Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so the A-League <clears throat> was starting in 2005 was the, f- the first season. Um, the clubs was being assembled um, late 2004. Um, because at that time, there was a, Australia was still part of the Oceania Confederation. Um, mm-hmm. before they moved into Asia and they needed to have a, a representative in the Oceania Champions League basically so all the squads was being assembled late 2004 with the plan to have a, a tournament in February um, 2005 which from that whoever won that would become the basically the Australian representative in the Oceania um, Champions League um, so yeah, I just wrote an email, Michael, to all the clubs, um, uh, just off the website, um, asking for a trial, um, attached my CV. I went on the FIFA website, um, got a list of all the uh, registered agents, Australian agents here. Um, there was only one agent replied to me, um, a guy called wow. Richard wow. Rodsky, um, who's based in Melbourne. Wow. Um, and he basically said, look, but we're only allowed to have, at that time, four foreigners. Um, your CV is not strong enough to get um, a visa position in any, any of the new teams. Um, but I'll try and help you where I can. Uh, and then basically, out of the blue, I got an email from Sydney FC saying that um, they'd give me a two-week trial. Sorry, a one-week trial. Uh, but I had to pay my own airfare and accommodation and all that, which was I was coming down anyway. So... Um, I come to Sydney for a week. Um, the first week there was about 12, 13 trialists. Um, at the end of the first week, we cut it down to five um, for three positions. And then at the start of the second week, um, two new players joined, two Australians, a boy called David Carney, who played for uh, Sheffield United, he played for Blackpool in the Premier League, New York Red Bulls, played for Australia in the World Cup. Really good guy. Um, so he got signed and then another guy called Matthew Bingley got signed. So there was, there was five of us trialists and there's one position left. Um, so at the end of the second week, um, basically Ian Crook, who was the assistant coach at the time, played for Norwich and Tottenham. He pulled me in and Dave Carney, sorry, Dave hadn't signed at this time. Um, and basically offered me Dave one year contract. So yeah, that's how, how that all come about. And then in the February, we played in this tournament and we actually won it. So we ended up going to the Oceania Champions League um, in Tahiti, actually. How did you do that? You just won it, did you? We won that, Michael Stutman. We were the um, Oceania representative at the Club World Cup um, in Japan. So that was in the December 2005. So the A-League had just had started in August 2005. And then in December... <clears throat> we went across um, to Japan for the Toyota Club World Cup. Um, the fir- we played Deportiva Saprissa from Costa Rica the first game. And then if we won that, we would have played Liverpool in the second game. Uh, but we lost 1-0. So that meant we dropped down to the fifth and sixth place playoff uh, where we played the uh, Egyptian champions representing Africa. Um, Al Ahly, they were called, and they were coming into the R game on the back of a 55 game unbeaten streak. Um, and we ended up, we beat them 2 0. Um, Dwight York scored and Sash Petrovsky scored. So that was good that you know, within a year we'd finished. Um, the chairman has got a shirt still made up now that um, we finished the fifth best team in the world without actually having won a um, domestic trophy. <laughs> um, you mentioned Dwight York there was Pierre Lebarski your manager at that stage yeah so Pierre is he the first coach yeah, the yeah Pierre was the first coach um, I signed in uh, March um, Pierre signed late February um, so when we were doing, when we were on trial was basically Pierre and Crookie would coach the mm-hmm. team in the morning And then they would come back in the afternoon and coach all the trialists. Um, And he was was a fantastic manager. I learned so much from from Pierre. Um, Training was, you know, what you said before about 
professionalism. He played in three World Cups. He had won the 1990 World Cup of West Germany. He was just on another level to anything that I'd experienced in England, um, even though a lot of you know, coaches that I'd worked with there were, were fantastic coaches in their own right. But Pierre just brought another level of um, professionalism, of attitude, of um, just mentality, really, to be honest. Um, and like I said, we started training in the March that year. Um, sorry, in the February. Um, and the grand final was the following March. So we actually trained. We did 13 months straight in preparation for the grand final. So like, we knew, without being arrogant or anything, but we knew we were going to win that year just because of the mentality that Pierre had in the group. Um, everything in training was was about winning. You know, if it was a a five aside, if it was six aside, if it was a passing drill, you, you had to be at your absolute best every day with him. Um, and he just demanded that from everybody, the staff, the players, the club, you know, the, the administration staff. And he really, he galvanized, you know, what was basically a startup club at that time. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a really good year. Even I suppose his whole aura, he just demanded respect just with what he had achieved, you know, as well. Yeah, the thing, the thing with him, Michael, is he <clears throat> anything he was asking you to do, he could do it himself easily. So you know, if he was, if you're working on free kicks, if you're working on passing drills or possession drills, like he would join in, and he'd still be the best player in the park. And at that time, we had probably five or six Australian internationals, Dwight York, um, and like Pierre was still the best player on the pitch, and you just couldn't get the ball off him. You know, he was he was frightening. The way he, and he demanded, like, like I said, if there was ever someone that was a bad loser, it was him. And I remember his his wife's Japanese because uh, he finished his career in Japan, and uh, his wife would go back to Japan for maybe two months at a time, and we used to dread it because I was one of the young players at the time, and we used to dread it because he just got bored and he'd get all the young players to come back in the afternoons for two second and third sessions. And we just play like what we call Sheva, like just a little keep ball session. And it'll be like, we start training in the morning at 10 with the squad. Then we go on have lunch. We'll be back in at two for a skill session. And then we'll be back at 5.30 for a Sheva session. And we were getting home at like 6.30, 7 o'clock at night just because the boss was, was bored and he didn't want to go back to his house by himself. So all the young players was in doing these sessions with him. And if you ever beat him or he lost, you'd stay until it was dark. And then we were up the next morning back into train. But just his enthusiasm for the game, it was just infectious. And he knew everything. He knew everything about everyone. You know, where you played, your family, your kids' names. And it was just a real good care factor from him as a coach. Um, and the, the boys fed off that. And everyone wanted to play for him. There was suddenly for... Nine years as a player, is that correct? Yeah, I played nine years there. Yeah, yeah so <clears throat> he wasn't the manager for all of them, though. Terry Butcher came in and he's changed managers a few times. But Yeah, so Pierre was there the first season we won the grand final. Um, <clears throat> we qual- Like I said, we qualified for the Club World Championship, went to Japan, won the grand final. Um, and then at the end of that season, um, there was a change in the CEO as well. The chief executive changed. So the direction of the club changed a little bit at that point. Um, Terry Butcher came in after the 2006 season. Um, so the 2006-07 season, um, Terry came in. He, I think he come straight from Motherwell, I think it was. Um, and he, he was doing great. Like the first season, we were actually top, top of the league with, I think it was about six or seven games to go. Um, and then we've got a salary cap system over here. Um, we actually got, the club got done for a breach of the salary cap. Um, so we got deducted, I think it was five points at the time, which meant we dropped down to third place on the league. Um, and then when it come into the playoffs, the way the playoffs were set up then, if you finished in the top two, you got basically two chances. So if you lost the first game, you had another Um, chance against the sixth place or fifth place team but because we finished third um, we only had one one bite at the playoffs 
Um, so we were playing Newcastle. Um, we drew 2-2 at home, um, which obviously meant Newcastle was taking two away goals into the return leg at their place. Um, and we actually lost the game up there 1-0, um, which meant you know, we, we didn't progress. We were knocked out in the playoffs. And then Terry left at the end of that season. Um, and then an Australian coach, a guy called John Cosmina, who actually played for Arsenal. Um, he came in as a coach. Uh, sorry, Branko Kalina came in first. Um, and Branko was there for, I think, seven games to the uh, next season. And then John Cosmina came in. And John was there for two and a half years. Um, and then we had a Czech Republic coach who's actually the Czech Republic under-21s coach now, a guy called Vilislav Lavitska. Um, he had come from Sparta, Prague. Um, he came in 2009-10 season and we won the double that year. Um, and then he left. Ian Crook took over, who was the first assistant manager when I signed. So Crook had come back to the club. Crook left the club and went back to Norwich where he was assistant coach there with Brian Gunn. Um, and then he was back in Australia and he took over the club 2013 season, uh, 2012 season, 12 13. That's when we signed Del Piero. Um, and then after, after Crookie, Frank Farina, who was the old Australian national team coach, he took over. Uh, and then that was, that was the last manager I played under, was Frankie. Um, I retired 2014. And you won two championships with Sydney FC. He was a player, Michael. Yeah, won uh, obviously 2006 was the first year. Um, <clears throat> then we went through, like I said, we went through quite a few changes on and off the park. Um, different coaches, different CEOs, um, and then it was only when Vidislav Lavitska, 2009-10 season, he came in. We won the double. So the double was we we won the league, which is basically what they call here the minor premier. So if you finish top of the league when the season finishes before the playoffs, you, you, you call the uh, premiership winners. And then if you win the playoffs, that's a grand final. So you're, you're actually the champion. So we won the um, minor premiership or the premiership on uh, Valentine's Day 2010. Um, we beat Melbourne Victory at home 2-0. Um, and also Melbourne Victory was the two uh, best teams that season by far. Um, we won the league by a point. And then we played them in the grand final in Melbourne. Um, and we, we ended up, we beat them on penalties. So we, we, we couldn't be separated the whole year. Um, like I say, to win the league by a point and then to win the, the grand final on penalties, it was a, you know, a kick of the ball either way for both teams. And we had some great, great battles with them over that whole year. And um, So that was the second championship that I, I was a captain actually for that one. I remember being in Sydney for a week on holidays one time. Lovely place. You've been in for, you know, the guts of ten years. An amazing place to play to play football to to spend your life. Like it's bound to be an enjoyable time. Yeah, it was brilliant, Michael. Like I say, I lived there for uh, fourteen years. Played as you played for nine, and then was on the staff for five after that. <clears throat> um, it's a beautiful city um, where we were living. Um, our first training ground was out in a, a place called uh, Park Lee, which is um, sort of West Sydney. Um, so as it, as it was in England, um, the clubs expected the players to live probably within 20, 20 kilometres of the training ground. So we got a house in, in Park Lee. And, and then obviously when we started to get to know the boys, when we, this was when we started, they were all living in Bondi and, and Manly and... Coogee and all near the beaches and stuff. So, um, but we just loved it there. Um, but yeah, you know, it was a, to wake up every morning, drive into the training ground, play football with 20 of your mates for three, four hours every day in the sunshine and, and, and get paid for it. It was a, it was a privilege to be honest, mate. And then I saw something on YouTube. You, you seem to be a bit of a fan's favorite. You had your own chant now at one stage. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, I had a great rapport with it with the supporters. Um, you captain for do. a few seasons. Yeah, I was captain for five years. Mm. 
they uh, won, like I say, won the championship in 2010, and then I was captain right through till 2014 when I retired. Um, so five seasons, four years. Um, but yeah, the, the relationship probably stems back, Michael, to when we had a bit of a family tragedy. My aunt and uncle was killed in a, a car crash. Um, and we were playing Central Coast on a Friday night and I had a decision whether to come back for the funeral or stay in Sydney. And again, speaking to Mark and, and my family, and you know, made the decision, which was very tough to, to stay here. Um, at the time and obviously the fans heard about it um, and they had a big banner when we came out to play the game it said Terry in times of need the Cove is with you so the Cove is basically like the cup at Liverpool it's where mm -hmm. all the hardcore supporters sit behind the goals um, so they had this big banner for me and my family and, and then from that day I said that I'd never play for another club against Sydney FC um, so that, yeah, that was sort of the start of the bond with the fans. And then 2014, when, uh, um, like I say, Frank Freena was a coach. He, Frankie was moving on um, and there was no coach in place. My contract had expired. Um, the club wanted to wait for a new manager to come in before signing any of the players. Um, so I was sort of... Uh, the decision whether to retire um, or hang around and wait for the a new coach to come in to make a decision whether I was going to play on or not. I had offers from other clubs in the A-League to, to keep playing, um, but out of respect to the fans and, and for what they did for me and my family in that day, I decided that I would retire and, and wouldn't play. So, yeah, look, I've got a, a great rapport with the fans there um, and still with the club. You know, I've got a lot of good friends, board members, directors, um, the chairman, a very good friend of mine. Um, and they actually have a they've got a bar named after me now at the, at the stadium so um, yeah look I've got a lot of good friends there and a lot of good good memories there mate Do you get a free tab anytime you go back? Mate funny story they opened the first time they opened the bar <clears throat> I had a couple of friends over from England and uh, normally on match day I've got duties that I had to perform in my role um, as director of football um, but I said look I'm, I can meet you in the bar beforehand for a couple of beers, walked into the bar and it, it had a lot of like jerseys that I'd wore over the year, years, um, different eras and things up on the wall, um, pictures and different things, whatnot. And uh, I went to the bar to get a, a couple of beers in the bar and said, oh, I'm sorry, mate, you can't, I can't give you um, any drinks. You don't have a wristband. I said, oh, okay. And my mates from England was pissing themselves laughing. They said, mate, how good is this? You've got your own bar and you can't even get a beer. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully, they had, they had the wristbands on, so they, they sorted me out with a beer. And whenever you moved into, you know, a role with the staff at the club, how did that sort of come about? Was it something you always um, thought you would get involved in? or? Yeah, it was, Michael. I always thought my plan coming towards the end of my playing days was always that I wanted to be a coach. I wanted to move into the coaching side of it. Um, I said most, all the clubs that I've played for from QPR um, through the youth team, uh, Margate, Woking, um, and then through into Sydney, I've always ended up in as a captain. Um, so I always felt I had that sort of, don't know what the right word is. I was always a bit of an organizer or a bit of a leader, so to speak. Um, so I always felt I wanted to move into coaching post playing. Um, I thought, well, rather than just go and do all my coaching badges, um, having played professionally for over 20 years, um, I felt that I had a, a knowledge of the game, working with some brilliant coaches and taking the best and bits from, from everyone and the, and the bad bits as well. I actually wanted to learn how to coach people and how to build teams and um, create environments. Um, so I did a Master's of Coaching at Sydney Uni. Um, and my thesis was developing a high-performance environment through the organisational culture. Um, so I really got fascinated by culture and individuals and how the culture of an organisation can actually drive results. Um, so... In 2014, when I retired, um, again, as I said, my relationship with the chairman um, is very strong. 
um, we went on a holiday for a few weeks, me and my wife and the kids. And the chairman rang me when I was on holiday <clears throat> and basically said, look, what do you want to do at the club? So I said, well, I'm just on holiday at the minute. What, what do you want me to do or what is there to do? He said, look, well, there's a chance that we're bringing Graham Arnold in as a head coach. So Graham Arnold's now the national team coach of Australia. Um, he was coaching in Japan at the time um, in a club, uh, Vigilta Sendai. Um, he just finished up in Japan and was moving back to Australia. Um, Arnie was Gus Hiddings assistant um, in the 2006 World Cup. Um, very, very experienced coach, former player, played in Holland. Um, really, really good guy. Um, so the chairman basically said, look, I want you to meet with Arnie and uh, work something out. So long story short, I met up with uh, Graham Arnold uh, just over lunch. Um, we had a chat about the club. Obviously, I've been there a long time. Um, basically, what I thought was good about the club, um, what I felt we could improve on at the club, how we could improve it. Um, and that was it. Basically, Graham said, look, I, I want you to join my staff. He said, I don't have any positions on the coaching team um, now, but I want to bring you in. As um, At that time, it was almost like a... Uh, Part of it was a mentor role for the younger players coming through. And mm -hmm. another part was like a induction or integration for new players coming into what Sydney FC was. And, and um, so the role was general manager of player welfare. Um, so it was basically facilitating all the things that can cause issues for players and their families that might impact performance. Um, so anything from a foreign player moving to Sydney um, finding them a house to live in, schools for the kids, um, jobs for the wives if they needed it, interpreters for the boys who didn't speak English, um, and basically just making sure that when they, when they drive in the training ground in the morning, um, that there was no issues. Um, so a lot of it was, um, uh, it was rewarding, to be honest, Michael, because not so much from the players, because the players get judged on the performances on the pitch. Um, it was more so from the, the wives, the girlfriends, the kids, when, when you knew that they were happy and you could see that in the players' performances that they had no issues at home. Um, so then from there, my role moved to um, football manager. So basically then I started, because I was with Graham all the time and, and we were doing a lot of things together around the culture of the club, around the environment, all of that. Um, one of the big things to enhance the environment and enhance the culture was the individuals. So we then set about creating a, a recruitment policy um, based on character and competence. So it was one thing to be a good footballer, but you had to actually be a, a good person to come and play for us at that time. And it still is now, to be honest. It's wrong to say that. Um, so we built this uh, recruitment criteria based on character and competence. So we did a lot of work on the playing style, how we actually wanted to play as a, as a team, what we wanted to be known for as a club. And then we broke that down into key competencies in each position. So what a, a right back needed, the hard skills they needed, a center back, a midfielder, a striker. Um, so we had a framework basically. Um, then what we did was we ran all the existing players through the competency reports. And we knew that to bring someone in, they had to be better than what we already had. Um, and as I said before, because we were working in a salary cap system, we could then look at it and say, right, we've got someone for argument's sake who's earning 100 grand. This player is 20% better at everything than the one we've got. Is he then worth 120 grand in a salary cap system? Um, so it was a, a kind of a money ball approach based on character, competence, and also finance as well. Um, so my role from the, the football manager um, from sorry, player welfare into football manager evolved through that. And then from that, I overseen the logistics of the, the team as well from you know, tra uh, team travel, hotels, accommodation, flights. Um, and then a new CEO joined um, and he was very commercial background. Um, and basically my role then 
change the general manager of football. So everything from the under 12s in the academy um, through to the marquee players in the first team, our W League team, which was a female team, um, anything to do with football came under me at, the, at that point. And did that um, university qualification just just tie into that nicely then? Yeah, very much so, Michael. Um, and, and obviously, you know, and obviously, the fact that you had to leave another country to come and play, you know, you're probably perfect for that role then. Well, I knew as well from my time in a, in the dressing room uh, and being the captain for that period of time, a lot of issues that players cropped up from time to time when I was playing would come through me. So if they had issues with the club, they'd come to me as the captain and say, look, I've got this issue, I've got that, I've got whatever. And I would invariably try and work with either the football manager or the CEO or whoever um, I needed to take it to at the time to make sure the players was, um, any of their issues was adhered to. So knowing a lot of the things that were constant issues like relocation, like uh, schools, like um, basic things that a foreign player arrives from uh, Brazil, mobile phone. How does he go about getting a mobile phone? He's, got, he's living in a hotel. He's got no address. He's got no forms of ID. He's got no bank accounts. Little things like that. So we basically just set up a, a checklist. These are the things that as soon as a player arrives, we go and get the health care sorted out. We get the banks sorted out. We get schools. We get houses. We get our phones. All of that. So it's basically just integrating the player into, into society more so than the club. Um, but yeah, the, the the university degree, there was a certain element of um, business side to it as well um, in terms of writing uh, board papers and reports and things. So I was, I was a representative for the football department at, at board meetings, um, and which then, as it moved into the, the general manager of football, and we, we actually set about creating our own revenue streams and in terms of transfer sales, um, the recruitment facilities, um, the sports science side of stuff. So just going back to what you're saying before about the professionalism, the sports science side of it from probably 2009, it's in the FC to where it is now is as advanced as anything in the premier league. Um, you know, at that time we were doing sleep studies on the players, um, heart rate variability, rest and heart rate, um, lactic acids, uh, everything that you could think of that would give us an edge right up until now. Like the players at the minute, basically, we knew what they were doing 24-7. And everything that they needed was catered for from supplements to uh, the chef at the training ground. Um, like the players would be sweat tested at the start of every season. We knew how much sodium they lost during sessions. We knew how much salt intake they had to replenish after the training, whether that was through magnesium, whether it was through iron tap, whatever whatever they needed, we had a, a handle on exactly what, what the, the players needed. Um, you know, they've got an app on their phone. They wake up in the morning before they even get out of bed. They do heart rate variability. They do sleep quality, sleep duration. Um, then they do stress index. Um, they do, and then a lower limb. Um, index as well so lower back glutes hamstrings quads calves ankles so basically as soon as they arrive at the training ground we we knew exactly the state they were in whether they were physically and emotionally ready to train um, we then took it to the point where we we filmed every training session so we collected all the data in the morning we then filmed the training sessions we every player wore heart rate monitors and gps units during the sessions um, so then we could marry up like, the data from the sports science team with the, the vision. Um, and it, it just become like a, it was just an everyday occurrence now. And then now you're on the other side of Australia, you've left it all behind. It's a tough decision. You know, you've invested a lot into the club in terms of your energy and time and, and building the club's level of professionalism up to what it was to, to leave. Is it, is it difficult? It was, Michael. It was a very difficult decision. Um, you know, like I say, I joined. Like you said, you didn't want to play for anybody else at the time. So even to switch cities then at that point. 
Yeah, it was a big decision. Um, like I said, I joined the club in 2005 when, um, you know, we barely had training kit. Um, to leave the club after 15 years, um, to see what it is now. At that time, we started with 20 players. In the football department, we had 20 players and I think seven staff. Um, to see where it is now with, from the academy under 12 through to the first team, there's anywhere between 180 and 200 players um, at the club. We got our own. We had our own schools program where there's an over 600 kids in the in the Sydney FC academy schools. Um, yeah, so it was a very tough decision. Um, my wife Emma, um, her family's from Perth. Emma's from Perth, and um, her dad uh, got sick a few years ago. Um, he got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Um, Emma's a nurse, so she moved across here a couple of years ago um, to, look, to look after her dad. Um, and I was sort of commuting back and forward. And you know, you, you know yourself, you, you, be, like you said you were here a couple of years ago. It's not like you know living in in Derry and nipping across to Dungiven. You know, it's yeah. it's a five hour flight from Sydney to Perth. So, um, like I said, Emma had, had followed me all over the world with football um, for the best part of twenty years. So it was my turn now to. Um, to support her and her decision and do what um, we needed to do for the family. So, yeah, we moved back here. Emma moved here in December 2018. And then I moved in July 2019, um, which I was very fortunate, to be honest, Michael. Um, I was, again, I was finishing up at Sydney FC. Uh, the coach here at Perth Glory is a guy called Tony Popovich. Um, I played with Tony at Sydney FC. He was a captain in 2008. Then he was the assistant coach with Vitislav Levitska 2009 and 10 when we won the double. And then Popo went back to Crystal Palace um, where he was Dougie Friedman's assistant in the uh, championship. Um, so he's the coach here. We played Perth when I was at Sydney. We played them in the grand final um, last year, beat them on penalties. And then it was basically after that um, I was chatting to Papa and, and there was a role came up here with the, the academy um, and it just sort of all tied in perfectly with obviously staying involved in football and, and moving cities to, to where we needed to be for the family. It couldn't have worked out any better really for you then? Yeah, from a, from a family and from a, a career point of view, it was, um, it was perfect, mate. And I suppose just to finish off, that I see you're studying even more recently. Are, are you involved in something else now? Or are you trying to move into something else? No, well, I've always looked uh, at my master's. I've always studied something. So when I finished that, I did a lot of online courses, did a lot of um, trying to upskill myself in different areas that, that I needed to improve, obviously moving into... Um, an office role even within football like, I couldn't use a computer when I when I finished you know emails and things like that was, was about the height of it so to go and do Excel courses PowerPoint courses um, just try and upskill myself um, I'm halfway through a, a psychology diploma at the minute um, that's something that, that's really always been a fascination to be honest the psychology of people um, and how you can apply psychology to performance um, so again going back to Sydney FC we, we brought in a, an emotional intelligence coach in 2015 to work with the team um, and it was a good friend of mine who was a bit of a mentor for me from probably 2007 onwards in Sydney um, and I worked very closely with him throughout my career playing wise and then it was great to be able to bring him in to the club um, and work with everyone and 2016-17 we went through that whole season we only lost one game um, out of, sorry we lost two out of 35 we lost the FA Cup final um, to Melbourne City and we lost in the derby against Western Sydney Wanderers but we won we won the double we won the uh, minor premiership and the, the grand final as well so that side of it for me is massive and uh, the more I can um, learn about that side of um, the psychology of people and how you can apply it to performance. It's, it's a bit of a bit of an obsession at the minute. Your career has been a long one in terms of travel from 
it's a long way from Glenview United to to over to QPR and Sydney and now to Perth. So, um, any big any big goals now? Aussie um, team, maybe. <laughs> nah, look, uh, you know, I'll sit back with Emma some nights and have a a glass of wine and just chat about where we are in life. And um, you know, we've got three kids now, and to give them the opportunities, um, they're all dancers. None of them play football. Um, all three of them are dancers. So, um, it's great watching them now and what they're going through with their, their training and their routines and different things. Um, I was fortunate, as you said. Michael to start off just having a kick around behind the barracks with some mates to end up, you know, playing for Northern Ireland and and where the the career took me that I've saw I've seen a lot of the world through football. Um, you know, the early days with Northern Ireland, you know, travelling all over Europe, playing in European qualifiers and World Cup qualifiers and things. Um you got to see a lot of different countries and then obviously coming over here playing for Sydney we were in the Asian Champions League by that time so um, getting to see a lot of Asia um, f- football has given me a great life in terms of travel and things so at the minute mate, the only only goals for for me is to support my kids in, in any way that I possibly can to help them achieve a dream that that I had as a kid to be to be a footballer um, you know their, their dreams at the minute is to be to be dancers on on the stage so I know what it was like to have that burning ambition and, and to have someone like you know, my mum and dad and my uncle Mark support me all the way. So, yeah, that's, that's all I'm focused on at the minute, mate. Are they teaching you to dance? <laughs> well, during the lockdown, we got, we got a few TikToks going there, yeah, but um, yeah, no, they love it, mate. They're out four or five nights a week dancing. So um, we're very fortunate. They were in a very good studio um, when we were in Sydney and then when we moved to Perth, we were very fortunate that the dan- one of the dance teachers in our studio in Sydney um, was from Perth and put us on to this one over here. So uh, it's all worked out really well ago. Terry, thank you very much for your time. You're very generous and hope everything goes well for you. Try, no try not to enjoy the sun too much. <laughs> well, it's just starting to set over here now, mate. So I think it's, it's nearly time to, to crack open a beer and relax for the night. <laughs>